We're supposed to be transforming from what we are into what he is. One of the key elements of what he is is that he is holy. He is set apart. Which means that we are to be different than who? Everybody else. In an open and discernible way, distinguished from all other peoples. All right, so today we're starting a new teaching. I don't know how many teachings it's gonna be, but it's called Be Set Apart. Be Set Apart. And this is always my biggest struggle is the starting new teachings, you know, putting it all together. I think one of these weeks I'm gonna actually start a teaching by bringing the whole thing in front of you and have you watch what I do to put a teaching together. And you can see how much that is and what it takes to do that, as I have to whittle this down into something that's organized verse upon verse and makes any sense. And so the hard part for me is that I have all these verses about being set apart, but what's the right order to make the point to you to paint that picture? And so we're just gonna start and we'll see, I may need to make adjustments. By the way, for some of you, that's why often I just start in Genesis and just take every verse in order because that's the simplest thing to do even though it doesn't always put verses that go together, together, because they're scattered, right? Line upon line, verse upon verse. So let's begin with this, this idea of set apart with the verse in Leviticus 19 and in verse two. Okay, Leviticus 19 and verse two. In verse one it says, Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel. So context wise, Yahweh is speaking to Moses in the vertical structure, and then Moses is going to speak this to the children of Israel. Everybody, all the children of Israel. So again, back to the discovering your identity teaching that we've done in the past. If you are here, if you are walking this out, if you're trying to covenant, you by definition are Israel. You're trying to be a part of Israel. The definition of the person who's doing this, this, and this is called an Israelite. Okay? Scriptural Israelite, not generational bloodline, etc., but scriptural Israelite. Whether you're bloodline or not, it's your covenantal choice that makes you Israel. So this is Yahweh speaking to the children of Israel. He says, be set apart, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am set apart. Be set apart, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am set apart. So what is this word set apart? And by the way, Later on in that chapter and into chapter 20, he gives us lots of examples of what it means and what it looks like to be set apart, what makes you set apart. And we'll get to that at another point. So set apart is the Hebrew word kodesh or kadosh. Kodesh, not chodesh, like, like rosh kodesh, but kodesh, okay, or kadosh. So what does that mean? I like that it's translated set apart as opposed to holy. Right, a lot of places you see the word holy. And part of this, this ministry's calling, efforts, whatever you want to label it, is to try to help reset the lexicon correctly scripturally for words like holy that we really don't know what they really mean. Because if I asked you and put you on the spot, what, what is something that is holy? What, what makes something holy? What does holy even mean? And we'd struggle with that, I'm sure. Something to do with God, we would say, with Elohim or something. But, you know, what makes it that? So he says, first of all, that we are to be whatever that is because he is. Okay, Leviticus 19, he says, tell the children of Israel to be kadosh, be kodesh. Right, we call it the ruach ha-kodesh, right? The Holy Spirit. So, because he is whatever that is. Now that makes a lot of sense in all the other verses we've read over the years that tell us we're supposed to be transforming from what we are into what he is. So one of the key elements of what he is is that he is holy, he is set apart. So the word set apart by definition means to be consecrated or declared sacred, dedicated or set apart for the service or worship of Yahweh. That's the definition we're using here. Now, of course, Yahweh isn't 
that part of the definition. That's what all other things from him would be defined as. For him, to be set apart is to separate something for a special purpose or to, and this is where Yahweh comes in, to distinguish it as different in a way that is open and discernible. So Yahweh is saying to us two things. One is that we are going to be distinguished from all the other peoples in a discernible and open way that is different from all the other peoples, okay? So we're separated for a special purpose. So something that is set apart is separated for a special purpose. And so we then can see that that has a level of being consecrated or declared sacred or dedicated or set apart to the service or worship of Yahweh. Because we're gonna see there are things that are set apart items. We can see, we'll see that Israel is called a set apart people or set apart nation. They're set apart places. They're set apart times. So these are all things that are distinguishable as different from something, generally speaking, different from everything else in the world, in an open and understandable and discernible way, and all consecrated, sacred in a sense, dedicated, set apart for the service and worship of Yahweh. Does that help? Keep that in mind as we go through the verses, that this is the definition that we're using. Okay, so there is a thing called the law of first mention. It's not an actual law. It's not written down anywhere like, like it's that way. But it's something that the sages have come up with over the centuries. So the law or principle or rule of first mention is a guideline that some people use for studying scripture. The law of first mention says that to understand a particular word or doctrine, we must find the first place in scripture that word or doctrine is revealed and study that passage. The reasoning is that the Bible's first mention of a concept is likely to be the simplest and clearest presentation of that understanding of that word or, or doctrine. Doctrines are more, excuse me, doctrines are then more fully developed on that foundation throughout the rest of scripture, okay? This is the theory that they're using for this law of first mention. So to fully understand an important and complex theological concept, Bible students are advised to start with its first mention. So where is the first mention we see this be set apart. Well, in Exodus 3 and in verse 2. All right, Exodus 3. And the messenger of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame, this is to Moses, from the midst of a bush. So we have this is the burning bush situation. And he looked and saw the bush burning with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, Let me turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, and Elohim called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, because the place on which you are standing is holy, is set apart. Okay, so it's set apart ground. So we see this. He says, take off your sandals off your feet, because this is, a, so this is a, a piece of ground and we'll figure out why in a minute, that is set apart. And so he said, look, you need to behave differently around set apart ground. I want you to take your sandals off. Don't ask me why, we're not gonna get into all that right this second. But the whole point is, he's saying this ground is consecrated, declared sacred, dedicated and set apart to serve Yahweh in some purpose as he's speaking out of this bush that's burning but it's not burning. And so he's teaching Moses this, which has to do with Yah, is serving Yah's purposes, is a part of his way of communicating deal that makes it sacred, consecrated, etc. Okay, so we're learning a little bit. This is ground. Now this ground is not holy because he's just pointing to a piece of ground somewhere else. He's saying, my presence is here. I'm speaking to you from this bush, out of the fire. So the ground that you're walking on because of that is dedicated, consecrated, etc., declared sacred because of that event and that presence, okay? So we started off in 19.2 in Leviticus where he says, be set apart for I, Yahweh, your Elohim is set apart. So let's look at some verses that talk about Yahweh being set apart. And by the way, there were lots and lots of them. So we're gonna go through these kind of quickly. I'm not gonna read you a lot about the context of what's going on. I just want you to see that he says this in all these different places over and over again because he wants us to understand that he is different 
in an open and discernible way and distinguished from other Elohim. Okay? And some of you are thinking, what do you mean other Elohim? Isn't there only one? Well, they're all that which is worshipped, whether it's pagan or true, are called Elohim. The mighty ones. And so whether we're talking about this pantheon of gods or that pantheon of gods, whatever, they would all be under the catch-all phrase of Elohim. That's why he says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. He says, worship me and not the false Elohim. And so he wants us to know that he is set apart. What does that mean again? Different in an open and discernible way from those false Elohim, distinguished from other Elohim. Now, planting a little seed here, and again, part ones are always a little challenging for me because I don't want to go too far in one direction or another and then confuse things, but I want to plant a seed here that at some point we're going to look at a lot of verses, maybe even today as we go through this quickly, about Yahweh telling them they're to be a set-apart nation, to be set-apart people. And that the children individually of Israel are to be set apart. Because he says in verse nine, chapter 19, verse 2, he said, speak to the children of Israel, tell them to be set apart. Which means that we are to be different than who? Everybody else. In an open and discernible way, distinguished from all other peoples. So that we should be different. See, the Orthodox you know, like the Chabad, the Orthodox understand this because that's why they dress in a way that you can see them and point a finger and say they're different. That's one of the reasons why they dress that way. So that they know who's who and that you know who's who. If, if, if you're walking around in the world and nobody can tell you're different than anybody else, you're missing the point somehow. If you don't sound like, act like, look like, behave like, something different than the rest of the world, if you, if you look like them, act like them, sound like them, etc., etc then you're not set apart. Okay? So Yahweh is set apart. He is different in an open, discernible way, distinguished from other Elohim. So I'm going to read some verses real quickly here. Psalm 89 and in verse 18. Okay? Psalm 89 and in verse 18. He says, For Yahweh is our shield, and the set-apart one of Israel is our sovereign. So you're going to see him refer to himself over and over again as the set-apart one. The one who is different, openly discernibly different, we're going to find out more about what set apart is later, but this is the one who's the sovereign, the king of Israel. Okay, the set apart one. Go to Proverbs 9 and verse 10. And some of you may have trouble keeping up. I'll try to not turn the pages too fast. Okay? The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the set apart one. Is understanding. So somewhere by knowing or having a relationship with the set apart one, we gain understanding. Understanding about what? Well, we're supposed to become him about how to be set apart. How to be discernibly and openly, obviously different in some way. We're going to get more detail as we go obviously through this, but just planting those seeds, right? Isaiah 1. Yeshayahu, chapter 1, and in verse 4. A last sinning nation, a people loaded with crookedness, a seed of evildoers, sons acting corruptly. Okay, so now we're seeing this behavior. Listen to what it says. They have forsaken Yahweh. They have provoked the set-apart one of Israel. They went backward. Ah, forward would be going towards becoming Yahweh-like, Right? <laughs> So now we're being told that part of going backward is loaded with crookedness, evildoers, sinning, etc., forsaking Yahweh. Because to do those things, you can't be embracing Yahweh. Because to embrace Yahweh is to be set apart. So again, he's being referred to here as that they have provoked through this behavior the set apart one of Israel. So when he tells you, be set apart for I am set apart, when you are called to do and you've covenanted to do and you don't, this provokes him. Let that seed plant a little bit, right? 
All right, let's go to chapter five. We'll stay in Isaiah here for a little while. Verse 16. Chapter five, verse six. This is for all you people that say, Rabbi, sometimes you only read three verses. We're gonna do a lot more than that today. Isaiah 5 and verse 16. But Yahweh of hosts is exalted in judgment and the set apart L is set apart in righteousness. Ah, another little nugget of the puzzle. Little C, a little piece there. Okay, so it says Yahweh of hosts is exalted in judgment. The set apart L, so he's the one that's discernibly different from the other L's, is set apart how? He's set apart because he's set apart in righteousness. So righteousness is going to be a critical piece of what makes him different, which means it's a critical piece in what makes you different. So then we get back to what righteousness is. Well, actually, we have a teaching called the pursuit of righteousness. I don't think I've quoted that in a long time, okay? But what is righteousness? Very simple, it's doing what's right. But not just doing what's right in anybody's eyes or according to anybody's understanding, but according to Yahweh. So he is set apart, discernibly different in what he establishes as right and wrong. So you have all experienced this too when you talk to other people about what you now think is right and wrong and what they might think is right and wrong. So this is part of being set apart, is that we have a set apart, different, openly discernible way of seeing right and wrong. But not just any way of doing it, a way that aligns with our creator, okay? So again, he says that he is the set apart L and he's set apart in righteousness. Let's go to verse 24, we'll stay here in this chapter. Therefore, as a tongue of fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, their root is as rottenness and their blossom goes up like dust because. So now he's giving all of these, this word of all this terrible stuff that's about to happen in Israel and he's gonna tell us why. He says, this terrible stuff is happening because they have rejected the Torah, the teachings and instructions of Yahweh of hosts and despised the word of the set apart one of Israel. So now he's the L who's separated by the fact of what he sees as righteous, what is right, and that all these calamities are happening because you rejected his instruction on righteousness. Because it's the Torah that teaches you what's right and what's wrong. So he's saying that when people behave in a way that's contrary, who should know better, who've been covenanted, who have made commitments to be with him, that it's like despising the word. They despised it. They had disdain for it. They didn't see any value in it. They found it to be a hindrance and a problem. It interfered with what I want, so I just said forget it type of thing. But he's telling you that the word, the Torah, is set apart just like he set apart because it's his set apart word. They rejected the Torah, despised the word of the set apart one. Go to chapter 10. We'll stay in Isaiah. And in verse 20. And in that day it shall be that the remnant of Israel and those who have escaped the house of, of the house of Jacob Never again lean upon him who defeated them, but shall lean upon Yahweh, the set apart one of Israel in truth. Ah. Okay, so to be set apart, and again, we're just getting little seeds here. He's saying that in that day, this is already after talking about the calamities and other horrible things that are coming because of the despising and rejecting and not following, and there will be a remnant. Now understand, a remnant is a small piece of something, not a large piece of something. So for the church to claim they're the remnant when they're one third of the planet, that's a little big for a remnant. Just technically according to the term, right? It's just not a remnant, okay? If you've got a hundred you know, feet of carpet, a remnant is like a foot or two. It's just a small piece from that giant piece. He says, this remnant, those who've escaped, will never again lean upon him who defeated them. Hmm. 
So what were they leaning on that defeated them? What actually defeats everybody? Leaning on their own understanding, following their own hearts and their own desires. It's not saying, that, oh, they were leaning on Hasatan. Hasatan's just gonna encourage you to lean on yourself. It is not in, in man, right? You know the phrase, it's not in man to even know how to put his feet. The way that seems right to a man leads to death. He says they're gonna stop leaning on him who defeated them, themselves. You're not gonna lean on yourselves anymore. Instead, you're gonna lean on Yahweh, the set apart one of Israel, and you're gonna do this in truth. So what's he mean in truth there? What did we talk about in the verse that says he's looking for those that would seek to worship him in spirit and truth? What's truth? The mechanics, the, the actual actions, the works of belief. So he says, you will now lean on Yahweh, the set apart one of Israel, in your actions, in your walking out the belief. In other words, no hypocrisy, no false whatever, you're gonna do this in truth. You're actually going to do the mechanics of this. And you're not gonna do it in a hypocritical way. He says, a remnant shall return, the remnant of Yaakov to the mighty, to the mighty El, okay? And so this is very, very, very much important. Listen, it says, for the, I'm just gonna go forward to another verse. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, a decisive end overflowing with righteousness. Righteousness is gonna be what happens, by the way, righteousness is also when they reap what they sowed. It is righteous for those to reap what they sow. If they deserve something to happen to them, then that's, they're reaping what they sow, that's righteous. When Babylon came, that was righteous. When Assyria came and took them away, that was right. Because he had already told them in Deuteronomy, if you don't listen, this is the stuff that's gonna happen. So for it to happen like he said it would, if you did what, you, what brings it, that's righteousness. Let's go to 17.7. We're still gonna be in Isaiah. 17.7. Seven. In that day, Man shall look to his maker and his eyes turn to the set apart one of Israel. So you have to make this, it's so simple really, but do you often enough make the connection that your maker is the set apart one of Israel? Now even before you knew about being Israel, you should have known that your maker is the set apart one of Israel whether you understood what you were or not. But your maker is the set apart one of Israel. Okay, that's, I might need to figure that out, you may be thinking. Because I thought he was the God of everybody. Well, his desire is that everybody become Israel. I don't understand. Well, go listen to the teaching Discovering Your Identity. You have to understand what, this, what your book is teaching you, what he's talking about. When the maker made everybody, it was in the plan that everybody ultimately would become part of this nation called Israel. Not necessarily by birth, but by choice. Go listen to the teaching. Let's go to 2923. All right, we're still in Isaiah. 29, verse 23. For when he sees his children, the work of his hands in his midst, they shall set apart my name and set apart the set apart one of Yaakov and fear the Elohim of Israel. Let's actually go back to verse four, uh, 22. Therefore, thus said Yahweh, who ransomed Abraham concerning the house of Yaakov. Yaakov is no longer put to shame, no longer does his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of his hands in his midst, they shall set my name apart. In other words, when they finally realize that what I did brought this into play, they're gonna realize that that's, and that's what Yahweh said would happen. Look, don't only believe in your creator because of miracles and wonderful things in your life. When all the bad things that he said would happen, happen, believe that too. When he says, if you do this, this bad thing's gonna happen, and then it does, and you see that play out all throughout the scriptures. All the things he said, if you do this, this bad stuff will happen, guess what? They were dumb, they did it, and then the bad stuff happened. But that should build the strength of your belief, just like the redemptive things, like pulling them out of Egypt and splitting the sea and all that other stuff. 
His scattering them, which he says to Moses he would do way back then, is part of the strengthening of our belief. So here in 29, what did I say, 29, 23. Okay? So when he, Yaakov, sees his children, the work of his hands in his midst, they shall set apart my name. So th- what, is, what does it mean to set apart? Now we're going to kind of tie some things together. Setting him apart. He says, be set apart because I am set apart. We're looking at all these verses where we mention him as being set apart. There's a connection to righteousness in the Torah. What he's saying is his name needs, needs to be set apart. You need to set apart my name. Listen to the teaching, no other name. So what does that mean? So the name has to be sacred, dedicated. It's supposed to be something that is distinguishable. In other words, what it represents. What does the name represent? Not the name itself, like pronouncing Yahweh or something, but the reputation, who and what it represents should be distinguishable as different as, as openly and discernibly different from other things. So if you claim Yahweh to be your Elohim, you claim this relationship and act like the world does with all of their other beliefs, you've not set his name apart. So part of you being set apart is recognizing that your behavior, your choices, and your, the things you do, either will set apart his name or make his name just muddied like the rest of the world. Because after all, you know that when you chose to walk this out, everybody around you just jumped for joy and was excited about it. Of course they weren't. Of course, Scripture tells you they wouldn't be. But when they're not jumping for joy and excited about it, they're also making note of the fact that, okay, okay, I'm I'm watching now. You claim you're this, this, and this. I'm going to watch and see what that looks like. And now you have to set apart his name because you're claiming his name. Look, when we put you in the water, okay, mikvah, baptism, one of the things that we say at the end before we put you in the water is go and be immersed in the names of Yahweh and Yeshua. In other words, go and come out and have those names on you. Claiming to be a child of the living Elohim. Claiming to be under Messiah Yeshua. All right. So what you do, one of, the, one of the declarations, the last one says that you are declaring and making a commitment to walk out the rest of your life in such a way that brings the names of Yahweh and Yeshua glory and honor and not shame. That's actually a declaration we have you make before you go in the water. Because after all, you need to set his name apart. You need to set his name apart. Okay. Let's go to chapter 30, verse 11. Okay, just move over next chapter. He says, turn aside from the way, soar from the path. Okay, so let's see, we gotta go back to where he's talking about here. All right, verse one. Woe to stubborn children, declares Yahweh, to make counsel, but not for me, and devise plans, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin. Okay, so he's talking about these things that are happening. Now, bear bear in mind, he says there, this goes back to even when he says you're no longer going to lean on. You're getting counsel from all the wrong places, is what he's saying here. So don't do that. And you're going to devise plans, but they're not of my spirit. My spirit meaning the fullness of my intention. You're making plans that were not lining up with my intentions. Remember, that's what we're talking about when we talk about when he says of my spirit. What you're doing is not how I intended it to be done, is what he's saying who are setting out to go down to Mitzrayim and have not asked from my mouth, et cetera, et cetera. He says, verse eight, and go and write before them on a tablet, describe it on a scroll that is for a latter day, a witness forever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who refuse to hear the Torah of Yahweh. This is our context where we're getting to the, now in verse 11. Okay, so they're a rebellious people, lying. What do you mean lying? Well, they're claiming to be of him and they're doing things that are not of him. That's lying. We're not saying like they're actually like telling lies. Their claim has them living a lie. You guys claim you're of me, but you're going to look to the Mitzrayim for help instead of looking to me for help. 
He says, who says to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us what is smooth, prophesy deceits. Of course, they're not actually saying that. What they're saying is, I don't like what he's saying, which is why they didn't want to listen to Isaiah, but they want to listen to some other guy. Jeremiah had the same problem, right? He's prophesying, they don't want to hear what he said, so some other guy claimed to be a prophet stood up and said what they wanted to hear. No different. Same thing with you guys with teachers out there. Oh, don't, don't teach me in things and tell me what is right. He says, I want to hear smooth stuff. I want you to tell me that what I want to do is okay to do. And how I want to be is okay to be. And that Yahweh knows my heart and blah, 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 blah. Listen, you, the next time you say that phrase, you need to hear screaming in your ears, yes, he does, so you should be afraid of that. He does know your heart. So he knows you're trying to spin whatever's going on to your advantage. He knows you're trying to justify what is not justifiable. He knows you're rational lying about something. So yes, he knows your heart. So stop using it as a justification. That's really gonna be the thing that gets you most trouble. It's gonna get your, instead of justification, it's gonna get you condemnation. He does know your heart. And your heart is not lined up with him when you say that. I've almost never heard anybody say, well, he knows my heart, because that's actually a good thing. That's you trying to say, he knows what a weak nothing I am and how I'm too you know, concerned with what I want in the flesh and I'm too much emotionalist to make the effort, so it's okay with him. Nonsense. He called you because you can fix that, overcome that, work against it, strive against it so that you get it right. All right, stop using that lazy, lame excuse. But he knows me, and I'm just, I can't do it. Stop. Okay? You can't, you can't, you gotta take your thumb out of your mouth, change your diapers, and whatever needs to be done, and stand up and be an adult. See, this is where I get all those nasty letters of people saying, oh, but why are you always yelling at everybody? I'm just reading you what he's saying here. And he's way stronger, actually, in his words than I ever could be. And yet, you know, he's saying, look, this is what people are saying. You know, speak to us with smooth, prophesy deceits. And verse 11 says, turn aside from the way, swear from the path, cause the set apart one of Israel to cease from before us. Wow. See, when you're listening to the wrong stuff, oh, we're gonna get in trouble now. When you're listening to the wrong stuff, and you're following the wrong stuff, the information that you need, the prophesying, what's prophecy? We've taught this many, many times, but if someone's watching now for the first time, prophecy is defined, law first mention. They were prophesying when the spirit that was on Moses was given to the 70s, the first place it's mentioned. What were they doing? They were sounding like Moses, speaking the word with authority. They weren't speaking about the future and this and that and the other thing and reading tea leaves. They were telling everybody what Torah was and what was expected of them. And so they weren't prophesying things that are smooth. Do not prophesy to us what is right. That's what prophecy is. Somebody getting in your face and saying, this is right, this is wrong, wake up. They're not teaching you what is right and wrong. You should already know that because you already had teachers. Teachers teach you what's right and wrong, but then you have to choose to do it, and when you don't, guess what? A prophet comes along and says, hello! Wake up. Why aren't you doing this? Oh no, tell us we're fine. Don't prophesy what is right. Tell us what we're doing is right. Tell us everything's fine. Well, that's what you get on Sunday all day long. Oh, actually, I, the funniest part to me on Sundays is that they're all yelling at you to stop sinning and they'll never tell you what sin is. We, you need to repent of your sin. I, I, what is that? As far as I can tell, it, it's, I don't know. Cheating on your wife or your husband. That's the only, I mean, they don't have anything that's real clear what sin is, but everybody needs to stop sinning, whatever that is. Of course, we know that sin is the transgression of the law. Well, but you can't really sin then because they did away with the law. So why are they telling anybody to stop sinning? Without the law, there is no sin. That's what they'll, you know, crazy stuff. 
But what's going to happen is when they listen to this stuff, they're also asking them to basically to turn aside from the way and swerve from the path, cause the set apart one of Israel to cease from before us. Because it's saying, he's trying to tell them, look, when you do these things, the set apart one will cease to be among you. He'll cease from being before us. In other words, leading the way, protecting us, guiding us. So be careful, I think is a, a good warning here, to be careful who you're listening to, what you're listening to, what they're trying to get you to do. Are you surrounding yourself with smooth words and deceit? Ear tickling, as other places refer to that, is the same thing being talked about here. Saying what you want to hear. Oh, I think we should just all sit down and sing Kumbaya and everybody should just love on each other because after all, we all believe in Messiah. Well, so does the devil and the demons and everybody else. I'm sorry, but believing in Messiah does not set you apart. In other words, believing that he exists. Believing in Messiah and changing your life because of that belief, now that makes a difference. That sets you apart. The devil believes that Messiah is Messiah. It doesn't change him one bit. So what, what is that? Every Christian you know believes in Messiah. And not a one of them is walking Torah. So what does that do? It doesn't do anything. But what happens is he says, look, you're turning aside from the way. Ah, so there is a way to do. He says, and when you do these things, these people will lead you away from the way. You'll be turning aside from the way, swerving from the path. And this will cause the set apart one of Israel to cease from before you. Look, I don't want to get everybody mad at me, not necessarily you guys, because you're already here, but people might find this and watch this and not understand. This is telling you that he is not in your Sunday church. Not the way you think he is because that's way swerved off the path. It just is. I'm not attacking the people in there. He'll pull them out when he's ready. But that system is this mess, okay? This is not being set apart. So part of being set apart, we're gonna see is that you have to go to those that are set apart to get things that you need. And he gives people roles that are set apart roles to do the things that are dedicated to, set apart to the worship of, and, and service of Yahweh that are distinguishably, distinguishably different and openly discernibly, that's their role. This is what the fivefold is talking about in Ephesians. We'll get there eventually. Let's continue here in verse 12. Did I read that already? Therefore, thus said the set apart one of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, therefore this crookedness is, like, uh, is to you like a, a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall whose breaking comes suddenly and swiftly. He's telling them, because you're looking to the wrong places, to the wrong people, to the wrong sources, this is all going to come crashing down on your head. That's literally what he's saying. Because a breach in a wall means that thing is going to fall. Okay? You have a wall made out of wood or stuff, like it's really like a stone wall. You put a big old hole in it, eventually the thing starts to fall apart and collapse on you. There's a hole, there's a crack in it, it's going to be falling on your head at some point, which is what he says. And he makes it a high wall on top of it, so it's going to really come down on you. Let's go to verse 15. We'll stay here in the same chapter. For thus said the master Yahweh, the set apart one of Israel. Why does he keep referring to himself that way? We already know who he is, but he keeps, I forgot in all my reading of scripture how often he didn't just say, I am Yahweh, but he says, I am the set apart one of Israel. And then when I do the study and see, it's like it's everywhere. He doesn't just tell you who he is. He wants you to understand that he is discernibly different in an open and obvious way. And Israel, therefore, is also supposed to be, as him being the set-apart one of them and they being his people, there should be that discernible difference as well. He says, in returning and rest you are saved, and stillness and trust is your strength, but you would not. 
okay? He's saying, look, I am your set apart one. In returning and rest, you are saved. You gotta return to me and rely on me and rest in me. That's how you are delivered out of your nonsense. And by the way, saved is not the Christianized idea of saved. Go listen to the teaching, are you saved? He's saying delivery out of this stuff that you're all worried about and freaking out about, delivery comes from you returning to me and resting in me. Resting meaning stop kicking and screaming and whining and complaining and fussing and fretting to do it all yourself. How about looking to him and those he's put in place to give you the guidance? Let's go to chapter 40 and verse 25. Chapter 40, verse 25. We're still in Isaiah. And to whom then do you liken me? <laughs> Isn't that the whole point? That he's not like anybody? Or to whom am I compared, says, thus set apart one. He's saying I'm not comparable to anybody. Now we, as followers of, as covenanted with, we are to be likened to, to him. He's saying, but who am I likened to? Who am I compared to? I'm the set apart one. There's nothing that compares to me. I'm different, openly and discernibly different. Let's go to 48.17. By the way, let's stay, stop here real quickly in 41. Just want to point out for all those who think I'm so mean. 41.14. Do not fear, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. <laughs> By the way, some of you are thinking, well, that's not a big deal. He calls them a worm, like they're spineless. No, no, no. That Hebrew word means like maggots that live in dead, dead things. Okay? So it's like that, those bugs that live in dead creatures. That's what he's calling them. Feeding on death. You worm, you maggot. So you guys are like, oh, you're so mean. I don't know. Yahweh just called Israel a bunch of maggots. That's what the Hebrew says. Some of the translations say that. Some of them say worm. He goes, he goes, do not fear, you spineless, dead thing, maggot, bug worms. You men, you, you men, he's like saying that about as sarcastic as he can. You men of Israel, I'll help you. Declares Yahweh and your redeemer, the set apart one of Israel. See, so he's referring to himself again. The set apart one, I will deliver you. But you gotta have to stand up on your hind legs with your spine erect and be a man. Got a lot of men out there not being men. The body is suffering immensely for a lack of men. We got a bunch of guys with the DNA and the, and the, uh, the, the genetic spectrum of being men. They've got the equipment and the anatomy of being men. They might actually even look like and sound like a man, but they're not acting like it. And some of you guys need to own that because this is a problem. Because otherwise you fit into verse 14 where he's calling the so-called men of Israel a bunch of worms. And I think the worm metaphor is really good because I think a lot of you really lack a spine. Because we think of the worm as being spineless. And where's your spine? You know, we've had, I don't even know how many people, but quite a significant number, small number, but significant in terms of who they were, some of the leadership that we've had over the years, where the men, and I'm not picking on the ladies for this, but the ladies had their issues or whatever it was, and the men followed the ladies instead of making the ladies follow the men. And the ladies left and the men followed. And I've had the men literally say to me, what can I do? My wife doesn't want to come here anymore, so I'm going to go with where she is. I said, I don't know. You could be a man. That's what you could do. How about that? How about saying to her, you go where you want. I'm going here. You want to be with me. I'm here. How about saying that? <laughs> oh, no. I, 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 I just have to go with my wife, you know, because, you know. What can I do? I'm her husband. I don't know, be a husband, be a man. 
tell her to get over whatever it is that she's whining about and get her thumb out of her mouth and change her diaper and get her whatever. Look, I know you guys hate when I say that, but you need to hear that because that's the image I have when I deal with you and I think that's the image he has when he deals with you when you're doing that. It's like, for crying out loud, grow up. I don't know what else to say. You can't be set apart acting like a baby because you can't be discernibly different in a world not his. Go listen to that teaching, right? Peace in a world not his. As a baby, because as a baby, you will not have what you need to stand up and be different in the moments where you need to be different. It takes a strength of an adult to do that. I don't know how else to put it. Let's go to chapter, what did I say, 48. And there's so many things here in Isaiah, we could just, I'm skipping a bunch of things. So let's just go to 48, 17. Thus said Yahweh, your redeemer, the set apart one of Israel. So now he's connected a few times in Isaiah because they're going through struggles. I am your redeemer. This is also part of the idea of the father and the son teaching which I know a lot of people struggle with. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation with someone the other day who told me, well, the big difference between me and other people is I don't believe Yeshua was God. I said, well, then you need to understand that you're confusing Isaiah completely. Yahweh says, I'm your redeemer. Okay. Yeshua is either Yahweh or Yeshua is false, period. So you can't have Yeshua be true and not be Yahweh. Go listen to the Father and the Son teaching. He's either both or he's nothing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then go listen to the teaching. All right, so here in verse 17. Thus said Yahweh, your Redeemer, the set apart one of Israel, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Listen to this now. Teaching you what is best, leading you by the way you should go. All of these chapters have been about going to the wrong place, getting the wrong information, he says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim, teaching you what is best. Now, how does Yahweh teach you what is best? Well, he teaches us through the Holy Spirit. Nonsense. That is not what you see anywhere in Scripture. He chooses men that are anointed by him to speak his words. That's what was happening with Isaiah and all the other people before and the people after that. He selected for that purpose and that role and set them apart. Because look, when we deal with the Levites, and we may do that at some point in this teaching, the Levites were set apart to do the work of service of the temple. The Melchizedekians, which are talked about almost zero in scripture, were set apart to teach the Torah. So they had a purpose that was discernibly different than other people's purposes. But yet it was still a sacred purpose consecrated to the worship and service of Yahweh. So it's still set apart, just in a different additional way. Because when he says to the people to be set apart, he's not talking about everybody doing the same role. There are other set apart roles within the set apart people as a nation, all right? So he says here, look, I, your redeemer, the set apart one of Israel, I, Yahweh, your Elohim. He's really beating this hard. The one who redeems you, the one who's your Elohim, the one who is set apart, connected to Israel, your Elohim, I, I am teaching you what is best. He says, I am leading you by the way you should go. He said, if only you had listened to my commands, then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Sorry, I was almost gonna sing peace like a river because I have a brother-in-law that sings that, but anyway. You all know that song. He said, but if only you had listened <laughs> to my commands. And he said, if only you had listened to me, to my commands. If you do what I say, it all works out. Isn't that what he promised in Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 28, if you take the covenant and do what I say, you will have all this wonderful things happening. You will never be afraid of anything. Nothing will ever go wrong. Nobody will ever bother you. That's what he says, essentially, isn't it? But you didn't, you didn't keep my commands. You didn't listen to my commands. So that's why you don't have peace. 
He says, and your righteousness would be like the waves of the sea, just rolling, rolling, flowing righteousness everywhere. Because you'd be doing commands, which means you'd be doing what's right. See, but this is why, you know, people say, why do you pick on the church so much? Because the church doesn't want you doing commands. Oh, that's works, and we don't want to do works. I don't know, Yeshua says, my father works, so do I. (laughs) Seems to be a lot of works going on. But this is that anti-Torah, anti-Israel, anti-scriptural rhetoric that came into the early church, to the early church fathers, to be anti, they called it, you know, you know to, to not Judaize, to be against the Jewish community that was keeping the works. Of course, they added their own problem with they added extra works that we don't need to be doing. Their own man-made works. And so actually the church wanted to be set apart. They wanted to be different and distinguishable from the Jews and those who were Torah observant. They just weren't set apart the way Yahweh says to be set apart. There was nothing kadosh about that. But they were set apart and different. They wanted to make themselves different from those that were in the Torah observant believing community. And Yahweh's saying, no, you also, you need to be set apart the way I'm set apart. Yeshua, which I connect as being the one speaking right here, Yeshua says, absolutely, my father, what he says to do is what I do. So you can trust that that's what it looks like to be set apart. And only what I do is what he tells me to do. And only what I say is what he tells me to say, because I am set apart to him. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. I think this is going well so far as our first intro. Mark chapter 1 and in verse 24. Well, we'll go in verse 23. And there was a man in the congregation with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Ha! What have we to do with you, Yeshua of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the set apart one of Elohim. <laughs> well, the those are, uh, the demons know. They know who he is. You're the set apart one of Elohim. Interesting. I know who you are, but do you know who he is? They know who he is. You know, you know about him the way some people have described him, but do you actually know, they knew exactly who he was. So the unclean spirit was like, what do we have to do with you? And Yeshua rebuked him saying, be silenced and come out of him. By the way, did you notice for all you guys who go to all these uh, redemption ministries and all these, um, what do they call them? Deliverance ministries. Do you notice that Yeshua would never had him repeat after me and say this prayer and, and own all these sin things and publicly embarrass yourself and all that? He simply said, get out. That's all he did. And I've been called to do this a few times in my life, and that's all I did. I said, knock it off, get out, you have no place here. Okay, I never made the person with the problem do anything. But yet you go to a deliverance ministry and they're gonna want you to confess every dumb thing you ever did in your life in front of people who have no business hearing it and all kinds of other stuff. And I don't see Yeshua doing any of that stuff. Yeshua says, be silent, shut up, and come out. I did that with somebody one time. I had a bunch of voices in the head and the whole thing, and I said, listen, knock it off, be quiet, come out. And they left. Now, let's go to Revelation. Ooh, I want to Revelation. Everybody gets all excited. (laughs) Rabbi's going to Revelation. We didn't expect that. So we saw all the way at the beginning, in Exodus, the first mention, all the way going through, Isaiah talks about it a lot. We saw it in the Psalms, we saw it in Proverbs, we saw it in a bunch of other places. We saw it in Mark. In Revelation, chapter four, in verse eight. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were covered with eyes around and within, and they did not cease day or night, saying, this is... This is going to the end. This is so we understand the, the whole idea of being set apart is not just down here. They understand this in the heavenlies. They said, 
set apart, set apart, set apart. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh El Shaddai, who was and who is and who is coming. In other words, in the heavenlies, they understand he is different. Discernibly and openly different that he is set apart from all other things. And we are in our communing with, our covenanting with, our desire to relate to and become a part of him need to be set apart as he is set apart. That's what we read in Leviticus, right? Be set apart in the same way that I am. And here we see in the heavenlies, they understand, as they say, set apart, set apart, set apart. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh El Shaddai. Yahweh Almighty, the El Almighty. Who was, who is, and who is coming. Which, by the way, we have that as Yeshua, right? Yeshua was, is, and is coming. The Father is, is just is. <laughs> okay? I mean, that's maybe part of our argument on the case for Yeshua, is that the Father just is. It just is. In other words, always was, always will, I mean, just is. Where Yeshua was, John 1, 1, is, right now we're sitting at the right hand, and is coming. And he is set apart. Set apart. So let's look at this expectation. Are we starting to get a little picture for this? He says that we are to be a set apart nation. I think we can cover this very quickly. I just want to read a, a places where he talks about that. Let's go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19 is the covenant, okay? Actually, we'll go to verse five. And now, if you diligently obey my voice, if, 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 if you diligently obey my voice and guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples for all the earth is mine. Now. Listen to what he's saying. All of the pieces have to be in, you know, when you take the pieces out of a puzzle box, you have to use them all. Listen to all of the pieces here. He says, first of all, if you diligently obey my voice, I speak, you do. You obey. Okay, I know a lot of times that's a real hard thing for all of you guys out there because you want to spin things and this and that. There's an obedience factor. Okay, he's in charge and you're not. He speaks, you do. Not he speaks and you argue and spin and try to twist it into something else. And you guard the covenant. Go listen to the teaching, are you covenanted? Then you shall be my treasured possession. If you do those two things, guard the covenant, obey the voice. And he says, above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. So I'll have you above everybody. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. So you'll be a kingdom of those that are set apart to serve before me in some capacity. A kingdom of priests, those whose job it is to serve the king, to serve the Almighty. And you shall be a set-apart nation. So as a nation, you'll be different, discernibly different in an open and discernible way and in a sacredness of that you are there to serve the Almighty. To serve those and do it in a way that is worshipful and provides people with an understanding of the desire of the Almighty, right? We said consecrated, declared sacred, dedicated or set apart for the service or worship of Yahweh. So as a nation, they will be that. In a distinguishable, in a distinguishably different way that is open and discernibly different. Interesting. So that's 19 and in verse six. Now, of course, he, he offers them this and then they accept. This is your covenantal thing. You better all know Exodus 19, verses five through um, eight, where they answer and they say, all that Yahweh said, I'll do. This is your covenant. I will tell you, well, we're in the new covenant now. This is the only covenant you need to worry about. Okay? The problem was they broke it and so they had to renew it in the new covenant, so to speak. 
It's not a different covenant. The creator has always had one thing. If you will listen to me and trust me and do everything I say and guard my relationship thing called the covenant, our agreement, then I will provide you with all this other stuff. That has never changed. That has always been what he intended from Adam all the way till now. In Deuteronomy 7, in verse 6, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6. For you are a set apart people to Yahweh your Elohim. Yahweh your Elohim has chosen you to be a people for himself, a treasured possession above all the peoples on the face of the earth. So this is, again, him remind, now he says this in many, many places. We're going to read this in Deuteronomy, a couple of more places in Isaiah and 1 Peter, etc. Okay, but now remember, this is going, what's going on. He's saying to them, let's see. In verse one, when Yahweh your Elohim brings you into the land which you go to possess, and he shall clear away from many nations before you the Hittites and all the other ites that are there, and when Yahweh gives them over to you, you shall smite them, make no covenant with them, show them no favor, do not intermarry with them. He says, but this is what you're going to do, verse five. You're gonna break down their altar, smash their pillars, cut down their asherim, for you are not going to be like them. You are different discernibly different, and they worship other Elohim, and you worship me. He says, because you were chosen to be a people for himself. Yahweh chose you as a people for himself, a treasure possession above all the peoples of the earth. But if you don't behave in covenantal manner, in other words, if you don't obey his voice, he's going to then go ahead and say, I'm not going to be your you're Elohim and you're not going to be my people. I'm going to turn my back on you for a period of time. And I'm going to take, take, take you out of my presence and scatter you. And that's exactly what happened. He says, but don't worry. At some point, generationally in the future, there will be your descendants that I'm going to bring back. All right, go to chapter 14. We'll stay in Deuteronomy for a little bit here in verse 2. Chapter 14 and verse 2. We'll go in verse one. You are, you are the children of Yahweh, your Elohim. Do not cut yourselves for the shave or shave the front of your head for the dead, for you are a set apart people to Yahweh, your Elohim, and Yahweh has chosen you to be a people for himself. Again, a treasure possession, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what is he doing? He's now starting to say, do not do what these people do, because you are different. And because you're different, you do different things. You don't do what they do. They cut themselves for the dead and shave their heads for the dead and do these other things. You don't do that. So we got lots of chapters in Leviticus, especially in Deuteronomy, where he talks about do not do as they do. I have a teaching called do not do as they do. Now you're going to understand why you're not to do as they do. Because you're set apart. You're supposed to be different. So when we start acting like and looking like and seeming like the world, then we are not different. We're not kadosh. We're not separated. Okay? Um, verse 21 of the same chapter says, don't eat whatever dies of itself. Give it to the strangers within your gates, etc. for you are set apart. In other words, don't do these things that you would normally do or the world would do. You are different. You are set apart. He says, you're a set apart people to Yahweh your Elohim. Chapter 26, verse 19. We're going to go through these quickly here. You'll see the point is the same consistently. I'm only hitting them over and over because I want you to see he says it not once, not twice, but over and over and over. 26, 19. So um, we'll begin in 18. And Yahweh has caused you to proclaim today to be his people. So this is now where we're actually ratifying the covenant. They're at the Jordan. They're about to go into the land. He says, look. Yahweh has caused you to proclaim to be his people, a treasured possession, as he has spoken to you, and to guard all his commands, so as to set you high above all the nations which he made, for a praise and for a name, for esteem, for you to be a set apart people to Yahweh, your Elohim, as he has spoken. So this is the reason you are here where you are, why he has opened your eyes, so that you can be a set apart people, part of a set apart nation. All right? Discernibly different. Openly and obviously different. Not in every single thing. I mean, you still do a lot of things that other human beings do. 
But some of the things that they do and you do are different, especially when it comes to your belief system. The days you keep are different. How you eat is different. How you behave is different. What you understand to be right and wrong is different. And it should be open and obvious that you are different. Go to chapter 28. 28, verse, now we're into the blessings and curses here. Chapter eight, verse nine. Yahweh does establish you as a set apart people to himself as he has sworn to you. If you guard the commands of Yahweh or Elohim and walk in his ways. He says, and all the peoples of the earth shall see that the name of Yahweh is called upon you and they shall be afraid of you. So what you do and how you do it declares to everyone out there his reputation, what he represents, who he is. What kind of job are you doing representing him? I mean, think about it. He called you basically to be an ambassador, to be, to be a representative of him. He's not walking around here for anybody to see. You are. And so you are called, chosen, bubble pop, so that you can show others what he is all about. And that's why I tell people watching on the stream, you don't like what I'm saying? Fine. But if you're going to act all, fo all the fool and get all nasty and throw out expletives and, and, and just do a drive-by, so to speak, and just try to blow up the chat, well, then how is that representing him in any way that you should? How does that represent him right? Let's go to Isaiah 62. All right, we saw this in... Exodus, we saw it in Deuteronomy, now we'll go to Isaiah 62. And we'll look at verse 12. All right, we'll look at 11. See, Yahweh has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, see, your deliverance has come, see, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall be called the set-apart people, the redeemed of Yahweh, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. So now we're talking about this sort of an end time vision of redemption and how this is gonna play out. It says, look, proclaim to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, see your deliverance has come. Hmm. But your deliverance for what? Your deliverance so that you can be called the set apart people, the redeemed. See, a lot of you wanna be like, well, I was saved and I was this, I was redeemed. Redeemed to what? To do whatever you want? No, you were redeemed. In other words, you were rescued, paid for, and brought back to. So that you could be a set apart people. Discernibly different. Because of the sacred connection you have with your creator called covenant. You are consecrated, set apart for the purpose of serving Yahweh. Let's go to 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2, and verse 5. Well, actually, we'll begin earlier. Verse 1. Having put aside then all evil and all deceit, hypocrisies, envyings, and all evil words, as newborn babes desire the unadulterated milk of the word in order that you grow by it, if indeed you have tasted that the Messiah is good, Drawing near to him a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up, a spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood, to offer up spiritual slaughtering offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah. So he's saying, we, like Messiah, who was set apart, who was selected for a specific role, you are selected also, and he calls you a set-apart priesthood, and I believe we're talking about a Melchizedekian priesthood where your role is to walk out, be an example, and teach. Not individually that you, but your life is a teaching. This is not calling you to temple service. But he's saying you, to be this, have to have put aside evil, deceit, hypocrisy, envyings, evil words, and as newborn babes, starting fresh, a new creation, drink of the unadulterated word. And this is again where everybody gets mad at me because I say this every time it comes up, but there's a ton of adulterated word out there. 
Oh, but you think you're the only one, blah, blah, blah. No, look, forget that, okay? Stop trying to ascribe to me some sort of pride, ego, narcissistic. Everybody's calling me a narcissist and this and that. Look, I'm just trying to get your attention right with the word. Okay, if you don't like it, whatever. Okay? Somebody's got to warn you. But I listen to everybody that's out there that anybody refers to me that I can find, and I'm finding a ton of adulterated words. Oh, well, you know, we just disagree on this or disagree on that. No, it's adulterated. I mean, there's a big ministry out there telling you you can cook on Shabbat. That's adulterated. There's, there's a ministry out there telling you that eating a pork chop is not really going to split heaven and hell apart or whatever, and you know, Okay. And it's not, but you're also trying to tell people it's not a big deal too. There's all kinds of ministries out there naming dates. There's all kinds of ministries. There's adulterated word. And you need to have enough discernment to figure that out and not be drinking of the adulterated word. And then you're going to wonder. It's like, you know what? You eat all the junk you eat. You eat all the high fructose corn syrup and all the other stuff that's no good for you. And then you get fat and you wonder how that happened. <laughs> well, I don't understand. <laughs> well, you might want to look at what you've been eating. Well, guess what? Your life gets all fat in a bad way. And you, how did that happen? Well, because you're eating of stuff that's not giving you the right nutrition. It's adulterated. He says, as newborn babes, then desire that. You need to desire. So you have to desire it, not just go. You have to be wanting it to be unadulterated. Well, I don't know what adulterated looks like. Well, then you need to find a teacher. And we'll get back to Ephesians 4 every time because Paul says that's why these guys are here. You need to find them. And he says, then drawing near to him a living stone rejected indeed by men, which then you are also living stones, he says, also rejected by men, being built up a set, into a spiritual house, a set apart priesthood. And it's to offer up spiritual slaughtering offerings except Elohim. What is he looking for? Obedience. Obedience. Let's go to verse 9. Same chapter. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a set apart nation, a people for a possession, that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into light. That's the whole difference. The world is in darkness. Go listen to the teaching darkness and light. The world is in darkness because it's rejecting the light of the world. Listen to that teaching, Yeshua, the light of the world. I might set a new record for naming teachings. But you need to listen to that. You need to understand. He says he called you. Don't be, oh, you just want to focus on, we're chosen and we're a royal priesthood and I'm a king and a priest and I'm, to do what? Not if you're still walking in darkness, embracing darkness, promoting darkness, Oh, I'm not doing any such thing. If it's adulterated word, you are. You got to be in the light. Yeshua is the light. The word is the light. He says, the Torah is a lamp. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Psalm 119. You have to understand what this is, what, what this is saying. Oh, no. I just want to focus on I'm a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a set-apart nation. And we're proclaiming praises. What? We're proclaiming the praise because he pulled you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What's his light? Yeshua, the Torah, the truth, the way, the path, the life. I mean, come on. Right? He says... Because you were once not a people, but now the people of Elohim who have not obtained compassion and now obtained compassion. This is talking about Hosea again, where he said, Lo ruchama, no mercy, lo ami, not my people. That was the punishment for all their foolishness. He says, but now, this is the good news, by the way. 
The good news is that he's now doing the fulfilling of the promise to start bringing back and showing compassion and saying, you are now the children of the living Elohim, where you once were not. And by the way, they were not because of their choices, not because they hadn't had their bubble pop, but because they chose to go in a wrong direction. And so he chose to go in a different direction from them too. We have to get this. He says in verse 11, he said, beloved ones, I appeal to you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from the fleshly lusts which battle against the life. Having your behavior among the Gentiles good so that when they speak against you as evildoers, let them, by observing your good works, esteem Elohim in a day of visitation. In other words, if you're doing what's right, when Elohim shows up, they'll realize they falsely accused you. But if you're doing the dumb things, then they're going to be right because they accused you and you deserved it. But don't give in to the fleshly lusts. What is the fleshly lust? Let's minimize the stupidity with this because people only, when I hear the word lust, it works for me. I usually go right to some sort of sexual thing. No, lust means I want it and I want it really bad, whatever it is. Or I don't want it and I don't want it really bad. And it's my flesh that wants it or doesn't want it. I don't care what it is. Power, authority, recognition, love, you know, honor, respect, what, something. I want to do what I want to do. I want to be what I want to be. And I don't care. That's the fleshly lust when they are against the Torah. And so it's just call it desires. You need to. He says, I appeal to you to abstain from giving into your desires of the flesh. The me, 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 me. He says, you have to have your behavior among the Gentiles be good. Why? Because you represent him as a set-apart person. What kind of representation are you making? <laughs> This is important that we get this. All right, we're going to close with that, and next week we're going to continue with why be set apart. Why should we do this? All right? Hopefully that was a good start. Hopefully that made sense. Let's go ahead and pray. Hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's pray first. Father, we want to come before you, and Father, we want to fully be set apart. We understand that you are, and we need to understand all of what that means so that we could be set apart as you are set apart. So Father, help us to have open minds, open ears, open eyes, open hearts, so that we can truly embrace what you would have us in an unadulterated way, the unadulterated word to teach us how we are to be what you desire us to be, which is a set apart people. So Father, we want to thank you for the calling. We want to thank you for the mercy and compassion and patience you pour out on us every day as we go through this process of changing from what we are into what you are, which is a set-apart Elohim. So Father, we thank you, praise you, and ask all, in the name above all names, the set-apart one that you set apart to be our Messiah, Yeshua Messiah. Amen. 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 <laughs>